just like last year, you got changes you're going to make, and so on and so forth. You know, come the first Sunday in February, it'll change a little bit around here because we have a whole group of people who will be start joining us. International House of Hope is going to become part of Bethel. And so you're going to have a wonderful opportunity to meet and greet and get to know people who are so profoundly different than you that uh, it will just enrich, enrich and enhance your life in ways you don't even know yet. And I look forward to it. I think it's going to be a wonderful thing. I uh, made sure that everybody should have had this on their chair or right around them. The, uh, the match for us is a very important uh, little uh, piece of imagery. And it has all the ingredients to fulfill its purpose, but it remains useless until it's actually ignited. Which is why for us it's a, it's a metaphor. When, when the spark of God meets the tinder of our life, change begins to happen. Now, once a match is lit, you have to be careful with it. You can't just go running around or it'll do what? It'll, the wind will blow it out to make sure it doesn't get around any kind of water. So what you find that oftentimes, if you've never lit in a match, you, you light a match and you're actually taking it somewhere, you tend to cup your hand around it because you want to you wanna protect and keep the flame that started going. But it was never intended to be just itself. Once that flame is transferred, it's transferred to something bigger than itself and it begins to grow. It becomes a, it becomes a force. It becomes something that uh, becomes attractive for other people. We're certainly in a time of the year when Clarissa and I went up to Tennessee to visit our kids last week. Where fires are just something you talk about. And, you know, people ask me, do you miss uh, having a fireplace? And we have a fireplace. It's just as a gas fireplace. You turn the gas on, you light a match or use one of our lighters. You light it and it starts. It does not require me to go out in, in August or September and cut down trees and chop wood. It doesn't require me to go out on a cold winter's morning and gather kindling and bring it in and start a fire. It doesn't require any of that. I mean, I just light it and goes. Now, when we were in Arizona, we had a wood stove. It was a normal way that we uh, heated our, our house. And you know, the, the, our spiritual life, by the way, is also not uh, like a gas fireplace. It's not something that you just turn on and you put the fire to it and boom, it's going to go and it's going to just have this continuous uh, stream of, of gas that'll keep it lit. It's actually something that requires us to tend. It requires us to take care of it. It requires us to add something to it. Depending where we're, we're at in life, it requires just a little bit more. Sometimes that might be uh, labeled something like patience. But the re reality is, regardless of where we're at in our spiritual life, the flame that the Lord has started in our hearts requires tending. I liked what Rex said last week, because I think it all sort of applies here, is that one of the things that we're going to talk a lot about this year is we need to learn to burn. Say that with me. Learn to burn. The better we learn to burn, uh, the better off we are with that flame being tended. When I was a little rich, we actually every year would go and we would cut down trees. They were alder trees and, and we would cut them down for the purpose of burning. But when you cut the trees down and you, and you chopped them up into areas and they were stacked, they actually had to wait a year because they actually had to, to dry out because they weren't quite ready to be put onto an open flame. Because if you've ever burnt wet wood, what you get with wet wood is a lot of smoke and it's really kind of irritating. I'm pausing because I'm letting the Holy Spirit to take you to some wet wood Christians that maybe you find irritating at times because they're trying to burn something that in their life that is still wet. I know a lot of Christians that tend to be really wet with a whole lot of religion. And whenever that religion starts to get lit, there's a whole lot of smoke and not much heat. But what kind of wood are you? Are you still at the match stage where the spark of God has not actually happened, so there really is no flame? Or are you at a place where you're 
still wet, where there's, there's an area of your life that is not allowing God to allow the full combustion that he desires to happen in your life. You know, there are a couple different kinds of wood, by the way. There's soft wood and there's hard wood. And when it comes to burning, it's important to know whether you have soft wood or you have hard wood. Early in any kind of fire, you want soft wood because it burns quickly and it burns hot, but it also burns out. And there are some Christians that their, their, their spiritual makeup is a little bit like that soft wood. They burn hot for a bit and then, and then it burns out. Maybe you found that out to be true to your goals when you come into a year. This year, I'm going to do this, and, and, and I'm going to eat this way, or I'm going to exercise, or I'm going to save this money, or I'm going to give this money, and you're all excited for a bit, but then it burns out. And the reason that is, is because the material that you're trying to work with is just soft wood. But then there's hardwood. Hardwood actually requires other flames, other things to get it going, but once you have a hardwood, it's going to burn for a while. In fact, when, when we were in Arizona, I would always make sure to have plenty of oak because before I went to bed, I would fill the wood stove with oak. You know why? Because in the morning, there would be what? Coals. There'd be coals because it would, it would slowly burn all night long. And then when I was ready, boom, be ready for it to start up again. The longer we are followers of Jesus, we're intended to have a, a spirituality that represents a, a dynamic of coals that others could come to and they can find that their life, their spiritual life, gets lit up. I loved, uh, I loved uh, Rex's sermon last week. I, you know, when, when Clarice and I are driving back, we were actually driving from Murfreesboro towards Little Rock and and we're listening to the sermon, and, uh, and I'm just assuming that there were no mics that could pick up here because he's doing this all fiery sermon. No one's saying anything. Do you remember what he kept saying? We need to get fired up. But there didn't sound like there was a lot of firing up in the room. I'm just assuming that that's because of the mics. It wasn't because of you guys, I'm sure. Because, because your wood, your spiritual wood, is just waiting for those moments to ignite. And as soon as it ignites, you're like, boom, it's on fire. All right, so he preached about getting fired up. I want to talk to you about staying fired up because we need to stay fired up. When I look at 2024, I, I'll just be quite honest with you, in the flesh, as me, as a person, if I'm not careful, here's what I want to do. I want to get in bed and I want to take the covers and put it over my head and I want to wait until January 2025, then I'll take it off. I mean, let's face it, 2024 started really rocking because we had a 7.5 earthquake in Japan. That may not mean anything to you, but let me tell you something. My parents, they live on the coast of Washington. And they live where there's a whole bunch of signs saying, this is the way to go for a tsunami. And it's only a two-lane road. He sold his motorcycle. He shouldn't be on a motorcycle anyway, but that would be the way to get out. In fact, if you, if you remember back, I think it was 2011 when they had the big earthquake and, and actually it, it affected the, the nuclear power plants there in Japan. Where my parents lived, it actually killed trees. There are trees that are standing dead because of the nuclear waste that leaked in Japan and ended up there. Sometimes we think when things are halfway around the world, they don't affect us. But I'm telling you that we're moving into a day, and I think we've already been there because we live in a very complicated day as it is, right? I mean, just our, our world is really complicated. In fact, you know, I'm, you know, Chris and I regularly pray for, for people who are single and are looking to get married because we now live in a day, and some of you, if you're single, you know this, it's hard to even date without having your own single resume. Right? I mean, we live in a day where raising children is extremely unique. You have to raise children in a day where we are uniquely connected as never before, and yet we are more isolated as never before. From, from June 22 to June 23, 70% of people that bought houses in America had no children under 18 in their home. Our world's getting more complicated. We're, we're now having to be concerned about artificial intelligence taking over parts of the job market. Well, it's always a thing. Will World War III break out? But our country is divided and fueled by hate as never before. So I just want to go whoosh, cover my head 
and wait until 2025. That's, that's, the, that's the flesh part of rich. It's the, it's the human side of me. But we're not, we're not really called to do that, are we? I know there are Christians that they try to live the bunker down Christianity. I'm just going to make it until Jesus comes back. But that's not what we're called to. We're called to something more. Because it's not just us. The, the tender of our lives have been ignited by a spiritual force that created everything that we see and everything that we cannot see. So the message to the church today is stay fired up. Because Jesus addressed, and, and, and then Paul kind of echoes this, this thing where, where, where if we're not careful, we're not going to stay fired up. In Luke chapter 21... Jesus said this, and this is, of course, in the context of last days, but there's a greater principle that I just, rather than trying to figure out whether it's the last days or not, whether it fits into your theology or not, there's a greater principle that Jesus is giving here. He says, but watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down. Go ahead and bring that scripture up there if you would. And because I want you to see this word. It says, but watch yourself, lest your hearts be weighed down with dispensation. Now, th- that word there, dispensation, is, is really a word that is um, looking for the next good thing. Now, whether that's looking for the next good party or that's looking for the next good paycheck, or that's looking for the next good relationship. Jesus is saying we have to be careful. We have to watch out that our lives don't get bogged down, don't get weighed down with looking for the next best, greatest thing. And in a world where the next best, greatest thing is always in front of us, we have to take extra special care. I'm assuming you guys didn't go and and we're like completely drunk at New Year's <laughs> Eve, right? Because Jesus says, he says, watch out lest your hearts be weighed down. And with drunkenness, it's the, when we read that stuff, our, our tendency, get this, our tendency is to dis, disassociate ourselves with the scripture. But drunkenness literally has to, has to do with a person being in, have an inability to control themselves. Boy, that has never spoken of any Christians I've ever known before. But what happens if we're not careful is that life will come and begin to weigh down, so much so that you think you're not in control of your own life. Thank God for the government. That was a joke. But the cares of life. We live in an incredibly anxious world where people have anxiety at levels that I got to wonder if have ever been at this rate ever in the history of humanity. We're the most informed and we're the most anxious. Because he said, in that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Now, he's speaking of the end times, but I said there's a greater principle here. If you find that that your life is such to to where there's no flame, or you're just some ember, then then all of a sudden, something happens in life, some catastrophe, somebody dies, or you're in an accident, or you're fired from a job, or whatever it might be, that situation becomes a trap. And it extinguishes, it weighs down in such a way that you're ineffective in your Christian walk. And so Jesus is saying what? Stay fired up. Stay fired up. Say it with me. Stay fired up. Paul understood this when he is writing in Romans in chapter 13. He says this. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to do what? To wake from sleep. Now, he's talking to Christians. He's not talking to to people who are not saved because he goes on, he goes, so salvation is nearer to us now than when you first believed. 
There, there is a tendency, there's a propensity to have life come in such a way that it, that it takes the flame of our life and whoosh, Could be anything from family to, to, to work. That's a, this is, it's the wet blanket that comes over and extinguishes that which the Lord lit at one time in your life. He goes on, he says, the night is far gone, the day is at hand, so let us not cast off the works of darkness, and put on, but put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies or in drunkenness, nor in sexual immorality and sens- uh, sensation, uh, sens- sen- sensuality. Boy, I can't even say it. Not in quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. So, what is he saying? That we have to learn to burn in order to stay fired up. Now, we're going we're to come back to the prayer and fasting because when Paul says the words, uh, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires, I can't speak for your flesh, but I can speak for mine. It's got plenty of desires. And if I'm not careful, my flesh, my flesh will control me and I'll get weighed down because it's going to be looking for the next best thing. It's going, to, it's going to think that it's out of control because it's not getting what it wants. Because now my flesh is in a place where it's getting anxious, but I'm going to say, no, flesh, you don't get to dictate the type of spirituality that is in me and growing in me and moving through me. You don't get to do that. I look forward to the resurrection where I have a body that doesn't do that anymore. I look forward to that day. But until that day, we have to deal with it. And so we have to learn to stay fired up. One of the things that, that just over the years that has really challenged me when it comes to pastoring and, and walking with Christians is how they believe that once they're lit, that's it. Now I'm good. Uh, and yet the whole message of stay fired up is throughout the Bible. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, this whole sermon came from a moment that I had with the Lord where I'm, I'm just saying, okay, Lord, uh, what, what's next? What, what are we going to do next year? And, and the Lord says, I just want you to live. How are you going to live if I come back next year? I went, well, I hope I'm loving you and loving people. But then the Lord took me into a, a place in the Old Testament. It's actually, I would encourage you to go read it at some point. But it's a guy who, and bring up that the connect again, because again, this is, that, this is the spark you really just got to get. Uh, it, it's, it's this, that we've got to stay fired up. And there's, there's a, a problem when we don't. Because in 1 Kings 13, it talks about a guy, we don't even know his name. The man has no name written in scripture. But as, as, as the man, it says he comes out of Bethel. And he comes out of Bethel and he meets uh, uh, Jeroboam. And, and he says to Jeroboam, he says, thus says the Lord, you're going, to, you're, you're, you're going to go to ashes and it's going to be poured out and God's going to raise up Josiah as king. And what's interesting is Jeroboam, he's there at an altar. He stretches out his hand toward this unnamed man. And the moment he stretches out his hand, his hand withers. Now, how would you like to have that kind of power in, in your places of ministry? You say something to your boss and he speaks something out to you, his hand withers. Okay, do you think that unnamed man is fired up? I guarantee you he's fired up. He would have never gone there if he wasn't fired up because he understood that he was putting his life in the balance. But the moment his life was in the balance and the king reached out to have him, to have him taken care of, his hand withers. And so the king says, you know, you got to entreat God for me because this can't stay. And he does. And his hand goes back to normal. And then the king says, I'm going to give you riches, money, anything you want. It's yours. And this no-name man is so fired up. He says, no, God told me to do this and go that way and not to lose my way. And, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm not taking any of your money.
But the story gets interesting from there because this unnamed man did not stay fired up. So I, again, so, uh, Scripture's funny because what we don't often understand is, is the length of time. It doesn't always give us this length of time. So he begins to leave, and he does leave, and, 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 then, and then someone hears about him. In fact, the guy that hears about him is just this old prophet. And this old prophet sends for him and says, you need to come and you need to eat. And he says, you know, the Lord said I'm supposed to go this way, and I'm not to eat till I get back, da, da, da. And he says, yes, but an angel came to me. And the angel said to me, you're to do this. And so, because he wasn't fired up, he ate with him. There's some things that we're just going to have to wait to heaven to fully understand, because then the prophet looks at him and said, you're disobedient, you're going to die. If, by the way, if you want to be encouraged, just go First King, Kings. You're going to go, okay. But the man goes, the mountain leaves, leaves his house, and out comes a lion and kills him. The prophet goes to him, and here's what the prophet finds. He finds the dead man, and he finds the donkey and the lion sitting next to him. And as I, as I said to the Lord, I'm like, oh, that's really nice, Lord. That's, a, that's an interesting story. But what does that have to do with staying fired up? He said, that man, whose name is not written in my book, did not have the substance to finish the call that I called him to. If he would have stayed on fire, there would have been a name. If he would have stayed on fire, and please hear me here, he wouldn't have, and we would not, ever be deceived by false spirituality. Yeah. When that prophet found him, and he found the, the lion and the donkey next to him, it's representative of a person who, who at one point has this fire, but, but they lose it, and, they, and their life ends up being ended, and the force... And the ability to move are caught standing next to somebody that is dead. Now, that's in a metaphor of somebody who doesn't stay fired up. And I would say that that's a metaphor of the church in much of our world today. Now, Jesus is not, this isn't a message that you stay fired up and you'll have a name. No, the name that needs to be represented with us is always Jesus. This isn't about fulfilling your hopes, dreams, and wishes. It's about staying fired up for the Lord so there is this change that is ignited so that the name of Jesus is glorified because Jesus will be glorified with or without you and me. But his desire is that he is glorified through you and I. And so we want to make sure that we have a substance that is ready and right to be able to, to be used by the Lord. And so the Lord is calling us in 2024, calling Bethel, People, whether they're online or you're in the room, he's calling us to learn to burn. Why? So we can stay fired up. Amen. So how do we do that? Well, I think the growing piece is we already do it. We, we talk about it all the time. It's just you connect, you grow, and you go. But I want you to understand when we talk about this thing of connecting, this connecting is always going to be taking the tinder of your life and having it rub against something that's going to ignite. It's going to ignite. So whether, whether it's, um, you know, it doesn't really matter whether, what part it is of your life, but the, the Lord's going to speak and all of a sudden it's going to ignite. And, and what does it require? Well, in that connection, it requires two things. It requires uh, an environment and it requires some form of ignition. And so our time with the Lord, when you, when you spend time with the Lord, when we come back to the beginning of the year, it's a good time to evaluate, Lord, am I, am I just looking to talk to you in between, you know, I-30 and, and 820 or in, uh, in downtown Fort Worth or Dallas, my time in the car, is that, is that my environment? Is that the only thing I got? Or is the Lord calling us to something more? Is he calling us to, to a place where he can speak to us and there doesn't have to be a distraction of the, of, the, of the road or the work or whatever it might be where we are saying, Lord, this, this, this is my, it's not my devotion, it's my devoted time to you. 
Because I constantly have to come back and say, Lord, I have to have an environment where there's an opportunity for you to spark something in my life. Why? Because I have to connect with you. But, there, but it's greater than that because what you find in, when it comes to this, this doesn't do well by itself. This is why when we come together in our life groups and we really start to place that emphasis at the end of the month that we really want to be able to, to spur one another on in good works and faith. And so what we find is that the life group becomes an environment where something can spark, where something can happen. Something that's certainly happened since, since COVID is people, people when they came out of COVID and they said, well, I don't need to go to church. Let me tell you something. Church is a good place for a spark to happen. And I would encourage you, if it is humanly possible, to choose to be more regular at church. Which I would expect you guys, you're at the first service on Sunday in the 2024. You'd better, you better, amen, you're doing good already. It's the people online. No, watch this now. This is the world we live in. And this is the truth with Christians. We demand and are irritated what other people do, but don't expect it for ourselves. Which is why the ignition is not happening. We want it to happen in them. The other guy. So it starts with that. It's the spark. It's the connection. But then there's the grow. There's two words I want you to, to really get in you this morning when it comes to the, to the grow piece. And it's, it's two words. It's just topic and testing. Topic and testing. Topic and testing. What's a topic? Topic can be finances. Now it's time to give. It's, it's, it's relationships. Then they hurt you. Now it's time to forgive. What's the topic? And then you know the testing's going to come. And, and it always comes around love God and love people. And there's always testing. And what God is, is trying to get us to do is, is, is to be able to go through that testing and to have ourselves grow to the place to where now not only is it useful for us, but it's, we're useful to the Lord. And now the Lord is able to say, ah, good. Now I, I've got the spark. I, and, and what you find in that, in that grow piece is, is that the spirituality begins to expand. All of a sudden, this little piece of stick doesn't work anymore. Now our life becomes a piece of kindling or it becomes a piece of softwood or it becomes a piece of hardwood. And now the Lord is saying, now I can use that in a way that is going to be effective for my name, which brings us to the go. And you got the spark, you got the expansion, but then you got the extension of it. And, and, and this is where, you know, people that are, people that, that believe that they are spiritually mature, meaning if that's you, and there's no extension of your faith beyond you, I would challenge your, your, your own spiritual maturity. Not one amen? No, because that's challenging to each of us, isn't it? Certainly challenging to me. I sit and go, crying out loud, Rich, you're the pastor. You should at least, because you don't ever do that. You shouldn't do the pastor part, but you probably think, wait a minute, shouldn't I live beyond myself? And when you, when you, when you think about the whole growing piece, it, God doesn't actually make it as hard as you think. If you will just survey your life and the people that are around your life, we call them your circle of influence, and just start praying for them. There are options all around us. I am going back to school next Tuesday. I'm so excited. When I went and signed up for for uh, Spanish, conversational Spanish. <laughs> yeah, right. So I got, I got a lot of, I actually have a lot of Mexican friends and, and I say mucho and that means a lot to them. <laughs> Some of you will need to Google Translate that to get it. But, but so I'm going there and I said, but when I went and signed up, I just looked around and I said, Lord, here's a new, whole new place of opportunity. I mean, I'm going there to learn Spanish, but God's saying, wait a minute, I, I want you to stay, stay lit up. And so if I'm going to stay lit up, that means I'm going to stay lit up in a class where everybody is a year or two younger than me, because it's community college too. But here's the, here's the thing. The beautiful thing is, is there's, there's options, so all you can just begin to, to pray. And, as a, and, and this is a great place for all of us to grow. Survey your options and begin to pray. You may know their name, you may not know their name, but I guarantee you, you can pray. And if you pray, you're gonna stay lit up because you're gonna have this, this, this holy tension in your life of the Lord saying, yes, I wanna do something here, I wanna do something here. And then what'll come from that is an opportunity. And then from that opportunity, you begin to share, you begin to say something, you begin to give something, whatever it is. The Holy Spirit knows person to person. 
that he's dealing with and that he's talking to. And so then we say, okay. The substance now has a flame to it. Now, let me just kind of finish up here. Let's just take the go pieces really quick. I've got literally almost zero notes, but two things. You've got to mark it and you've got to mention it. Mark it and mention it. Uh, this is just a different way of saying the same thing that I say almost every week that I preach. Uh, first and foremost is if you don't know where the Holy Spirit is asking you to grow, you're going to have a hard time getting it lit on fire. Uh, if you say, I want to be more like you, Jesus, well, that's not a difficult part. Are you praying all night? Because that's what Jesus did. Are you healing the sick? Are you willing to walk away from everything that you have? So if you're going to say, I'm going to be more like Jesus, I would encourage you to narrow it down. Yeah. Okay? You don't, you don't have to be the, the full flame of Jesus. In fact, I don't know if any one person could be the full flame of Jesus. That's why I like life groups. You come together in groups. And there you get much more of a flame and representative of Jesus. But you can say, Lord, this is an area I feel you pressing me on in. I, I believe, Lord, that you are, you're asking me to, to grow to where I, I, I've, I'm increasing my environments. And I got multiple places that I'm getting ignited for a passion for you. I believe that this is a topic that you're calling me to grow in. So I understand that if you're growing, if you're calling me to a place where, where I, I, I'm going to be trusting you for greater things, well, then you're going to be tested by patience and just know, Lord, you're going you're to help me with that every step of the way. But you got to mark it. you got to put it down. But then you got to mention it. What's, what's so sad is that the people in, in, uh, in, in the Western world that doesn't have a culture of community think that they're just all good by themselves. You really want to grow spiritually? You tell somebody where you want to grow spiritually. The principle, I've, been, I, I've, I've said it a number of different times. I'll say it again. This is the last dog that we're ever going to own, as far as I'm concerned. I can't speak fully for Clarissa, but for me, last dog. I'm not going to go to Clarissa. Now, why, why, what does that mean? Because the more people I tell when our dog dies, what's going to go through your minds? Is he going to get another dog? I mention it, and people hold me accountable. I need that. I love dogs. I get on TikTok and watch dog videos. They say, look at this dog cute, that dog cute. The same thing is true in our spirituality. We need, we need people around us to help us stay accountable. And so you don't have to be serious. You don't have to stay fired up. But if you want to stay fired up, make sure you have somebody to help you stay accountable. So then there's these. Grab this real quick with me. We're going to kind of finish up here and this, this basically, we really don't have uh, expectations of you other than we want you to grow. Everybody grows differently. Uh, you know, it's just the reality of it. Nobody's the same. But what this does is helps us know as a body what we're doing together. And, and so what we're saying is that, that, that we want you to spend time in prayer and fasting. That's a different, it's a shift, it's a different way of living for these three weeks. And, and, and maybe for you, fasting uh, food is, 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 the doctor would say, don't you dare do that. Well, then don't do it. Uh, some, and I told Clarissa, for me, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to fast social media. Uh, and, and Clarissa's like, you're not on social media. I said, I get on TikTok all the time. It's going to be difficult to not do that. My flesh likes all the different things that make me laugh. I got to tell my flesh No. But, but, but maybe for you, it's a, it's a lunch. Well, if you're going to do lunches on, on Monday, just circle Monday. And circle what you're going to say, Lord, these are the times that I'm going to focus in on you and turn away from whatever you turn away from. Food, social media, not your spouse, you know, not people, but just saying no to this so we can say yes to the Lord, right? Turning away from this to say yes with the Lord. A lot of different ways to do that. Some of you, you, you may just need to say, I'm not going to text for those three weeks. Some of you are automatically going, wait a minute, I can't do that. Because our flesh is so used to something, we can't imagine doing something. But, but so choose something. And, and you're, all you're saying is, Lord, there might be an area of my life that's too wet. And I want that to dry out. Because I want to stay fired up. And a church body that is fired up cannot be stopped. 
Let me say that one more time. A church body that is fired up cannot be stopped. And so it's up to us to position ourselves so we can stay fired up. And so, Lord, uh, we just guide us, Lord, as we, as we sing this next song, that you would just challenge us to the place of prayer and fasting. Lord, that over the next number of weeks, Lord, we can say uh, no to some things so we can say yes to you. So we can position ourselves to, to, to have a spirituality, a part of our life that maybe has, has, has gotten wet down with the cares of this world. And allow it to dry out so that, Lord, you might ignite something and, and cause it to burn. So that, Lord, we might not just be fired up, but that, Lord, we would stay fired up. Because in these last days, Lord, it, it, life won't get easier in the natural. But certainly, Lord, with you, all things are possible. And so we want to say yes and amen to everything that you have for us in Jesus' name. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This is perforated in the center. If you, whatever you mark here, mark down on this one. Put your name and your email address on this part that you've marked down and just drop it in the offering box. There's four of them. One, two, three, four. Just take them one and just drop them in there. And then we'll get everybody the total and what's going to be happening. International House is going to be with International House of Hope next. They're going to be doing the same thing. You know, we're going to be coming together next Saturday night. We're going to be praying next Sunday. Uh, we have a guy by the name of Kevin who's a national prayer guy that's going to be with us. And he, he's kind of, some of you remember him, he's kind of a funny guy. He, he wears a sports jacket with a Superman shirt because prayer is not difficult. You don't have to be Superman for prayer. And that's kind of his mantra. Written a number of different books, goes all over the world talking about prayer. He's going to be with us next week. And we're just going to ratchet up our spirituality so that we are positioned to stay fired up in 2024, okay? So fill this out. Let's, and you can sing at the same time. And then we'll uh, close in prayer.